Good morning. <laughs> wow, it's good to be with you this morning. Um, I am uh, getting back to a normal life with the lifting of COVID. And uh, after a little health hiatus, uh, getting my own energy back. And it's good to be back out on the road and being back with churches and pastors meetings. And I am just very convinced that God through Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit just has so much more for us on this side of a world of change. Some folks, um, scholars, say the church is in a 500-year transition. Before COVID, I was doubting that assertion. But since we've come through COVID, and so much political and societal division and anger, I'm now coming to believe that is true. But I am also not one that totally believes that Christ has never deserted his church and has never left his called people alone. And whatever may frighten us or disconcert us or worry us, in the end, it is okay. Because at the end of time, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you. Welcome this morning. Oh, and for the audience coming in on, uh, I should mention, for those of you who don't know me, <laughs> uh, my name's Dale Edwards. I'm the Regional Executive Minister of the American Baptist Churches of Vermont, New Hampshire. I'm in my 10th year in this role, and I've been, I serve about 150 churches across Vermont, New Hampshire, and one in Massachusetts and one in Connecticut. And uh, previous to that, I spent 25 years as pastor of the First Baptist Church of Lebanon, New Hampshire. And during that time, I was also pastor for seven years of the Korean Presbyterian Church that met at Dartmouth College. So um, I was a local church pastor for 25 years before calling to this position. And like I say, it's my privilege to work with about 150 churches across Vermont and New Hampshire. I thank you for your invitation. It's great to be here, and I'll turn it over to Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Feel the touch of hands so kind and tender. They're leading me in paths that I must trod. I have no fear since. 
May we pray together. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for this morning. We thank you as your people we gather in this place to worship you. To pour out our hearts, to know your love, to sing as you're redeemed and you're saved. Forgive us our sins, those that we intentionally commit and those we commit by a mission and simply not thinking. We pray that during this time you would take from us our distractions that our minds, our hearts, our souls will be given to you to be with you, to enjoy you, and to hear your voice for us. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The call to worship this morning is from the 15th chapter of the book of Exodus. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has thrown, he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. And this is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Amen. And our hymn this morning is number 35, the first hymn. Now I assume the congregation's singing. Okay, just making sure. Are you standing and singing together? Okay, good. I'm still adjusting too, folks. <laughs> and if we could stand together and sing hymn, Great Fanny Crosby hymn, hymn number 35. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son. Who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come, Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught 
great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come, the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. Uh, before this time of individual confession, um, one of my traditions when I was still pastoring a local church was to recognize veterans on Memorial Day weekend. So I'd just like to take a moment, if there are any veterans here this morning, if you'd just like to stand and we can give you some recognition and a round of applause. Anyone? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you, thank you. May we come before God this morning, looking into our own hearts. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. The scripture reading this morning, the sermon text is Genesis 8, verses 1 through 12. It is this point in the account of Noah that the flood waters are subsiding. I find the passage rather appropriate in a time when we're coming out of COVID. As the flood waters subside, the ark is coming to rest. And there's a beautiful way this passage opens. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and all the domestic animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to blow over the earth and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heaven were closed. And the rain from the heavens was restrained. And the waters gradually receded from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, seventh month on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the tenth month. And in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains appeared. And at the end of forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent out a raven. And it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. 
And then he sent out the dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the earth. But the dove found no place to set its foot. And it returned to him in the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand, and he took it, and he brought it into the ark with him. And he waited another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening. And there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah, so Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. And then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove. And it did not return to him anymore. We join, please, in hymn number 327. May we stand. So sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to seated please. And at this time we'd like to worship the Lord with his tithes and our offerings. And uh, do we have ushers to collect that or do you? We're not, passing the plate. not passing the plate. Okay. Good. Thank you Alan. Thank you. Um, and everyone can come forward with your
gifts and tithes at the end of the service this morning. May we stand and sing together, though, the doxology. Praise God from whom. be seated. Uh, please, Charlie, did I miss the offertory? That's okay. You, you want to go back and do it, just and then I'll do the prayer? Going. Okay, I'm sorry. I just <laughs> got that. Um, Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the gifts that will be given. We pray that they are glorifying to you and be using, be used to the building of your kingdom, we pray. Amen. Uh, I jokingly say they gave me a, they gave, as many of you didn't know, I had a heart attack on March 5th and I'm still adjusting to a series of beta blockers and stuff and sometimes it, I think it affects my memory. <laughs> um, so forgive me. Um, at this time I would uh, like to just open it up for a time of prayer, things you'd like to share that you'd like to pray about things. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, you know the old story, um, the old joke. Uh, what does it mean when the Baptist pastor takes his watch off and lays it on the pulpit? Absolutely nothing. I always liked the story of the Baptist pastor who said he used to time his sermon by a cough drop. He'd put a cough drop in his mouth and when it was dissolved he'd stop preaching. Pretty good system till he put a button in his mouth one day. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. And whatever turmoil our lives have been through in the last year, our church and churches have been through in the last year, I rejoice today that we have never been forgotten or left alone by the God of the universe. As I alluded to when I forgot something in the service, um, back on March 5th, I, I thought I had just pulled some muscles in my chest from sanding my driveway and come to find out it was a quaint little heart attack. And in this age of COVID, Laurie took me to the emergency room and she left me there and couldn't come back to see me. So that night, I'm up on the cardiac care unit feeling a little bit alone. And a young cardiac care nurse by the name of Brian came into my room to be with me. And Brian was originally from Uganda, trained as a nurse in England, and was now at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon as a traveling nurse. 
And apparently he didn't know he wasn't supposed to do this in the United States for this young man came into my room and it saw on my chart that I was a Baptist pastor and began to talk about Christ. <laughs> and he began to talk about God's healing power. And so even though I never saw my wife or my family until they met me at the door in a wheelchair, for two 12-hour shifts, they was with me. A wonderful young Christian man from the global south. And we found time to talk about the Christ that had saved and redeemed and would heal ultimately the both of us. You know, I, I, this passage about Noah, you all know the story about Noah. It's one of the most favorite kids' Bible studies in, in Scripture because, you know, it's got animals in it and water and two by two they go into the ark and, and you got Noah and his family. And the downside of it is that God's just judgment is coming upon the world and everything is being destroyed. But if you've ever been on a ship, you know what happens in a storm, don't you? It goes up. It goes down. It goes up. It goes down. And you can't wait to get out of that storm, can you? Matter of fact, you get sick in the storm. And I think of the ups and downs in that ark during the flood as God's judgment is coming to rest. Now, I don't know about you, but if anyone felt claustrophobic or uptight with your family during COVID, can you imagine Noah being in the ark with his, all his sons and daughter-in-laws and all the kids and taking care of all these animals? I have a theory that God brought calm upon the animals. And I wonder if Noah ever felt he was forgotten in all those ups and downs. I mean... The dimensions of the ark say there was no windows in it except the doorway going through the top. He couldn't look out. It must have been like being in a submarine except on top of the water. And he's tossed and turned and the waters go all the way up to the top of the mountains. And I love the way the chapter in Genesis 8 begins. I sat with this phrase for a couple of days and prayed over it and thought over it. For after this tremendous destruction, after this time of storm and upheaval, after this time of floating through the storm, the eighth chapter of Genesis begins by saying, and God remembered Noah. Wow. And I thought about us, and I thought about our churches, and I thought about COVID, and I thought about what a horrible year this has been. And I thought about the ark coming to rest, and God saying, he remembered Noah. I mean, take that to your heart. Everything you and I have been through, God has always remembered us. We have never been forgotten by a sovereign God of the universe who in his love for us sent his only son to die for our sin and rise again. We have never been forgotten by the God of the universe. I love the, the passage where it says, what does it say, the wind blew on the water and was drying it out? Boy, you can do a lot with that word in scripture, wind. Spirit, breath, wind. Ruach in Hebrew, Numer in Greek. 
wind. It always brings good to the body of Christ. When God created the man, he breathed into his lungs, and the man became a living being. In the second chapter of Acts, the wind blew, and the body of Christ came into being. And the wind dried up the water, and the destruction ceased when God remembered Noah. And there's so much in sending that dove out. That dove goes out, flies around, comes back, and then it comes back with an olive twig in its mouth. I think about a dove descending from heaven Onto our Savior Jesus Christ as he comes up out of the waters of baptism. Jesus is under the water as John the Baptist is baptizing him, and then he is lifted up, and there's the dove. When I pick apart that Genesis 8th chapter, there is this oblique message and presence of the Holy Spirit at work bringing new life after the destruction. And God remembers Noah. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples on the night that he was betrayed? He said, I'm going to send you another comforter. I'm, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And what's the Holy Spirit going to do? It's going to teach you. It's going to direct you. It's going to guide you. The Holy Spirit is going to be your counselor. I'm not leaving you alone. Because the Holy Spirit is coming to you after I go into the heavens. I'm always going to remember you. You're never going to be forgotten. My presence will always be with you. And no matter how much you felt your lives have been doing this, in a boat that's going up and down, in the waves, in the tumult, in the water, ultimately you're going to come to rest in my presence. My spirit, my wind, my breath, my dove will rest upon you. Um, over this COVID pandemic, I did a lot of Zoom meetings. Anyone have that same affliction as me? I don't know where this Zoom thing came from. I saw my wife trying to tutor kids on Zoom at the kitchen table. I mean, it was a riot. You know? And then I knew Laurie was having a cross cultural experience when I heard her saying, I'm a silencio por favor, because she had uh, three kids whose first language was Spanish. And, and she was working her way through them. And two of the Spanish speaking kids actually attended Pentecostal churches, which is no surprise in the Pentecostal community. And, and I could hear Laurie getting frustrated. I heard a silencio, por favor, a couple of times. I was in more Zoom meetings than I could handle. And one of the Zoom meetings I'm in is with what's called a, I guess the bet, no way to describe it, is a pan-Baptist group. It's a bunch of regional Baptist leaders that stretch from Vermont and New Hampshire, which is me, all the way down to Baylor University in Texas. <laughs> and there's guys in Virginia... There's, there's people in Texas, there's people in Oklahoma, there's people in Washington State, there's people in Michigan, there's people in New Jersey. There's a good colleague of mine, my counterpart in Nebraska. And there's, there's um, uh, 
all these Baptist people across Baptist tribal groups. How's that for a description? <laughs> and we're white and we're black and we're Asian and we're together. And the Canadian Baptists came in this year. And it's kind of under this big umbrella of something called the Baptist World Alliance. And you know what we kept saying during that Zoom meeting? What is this going to look like when COVID is over? What is it going to look like as we pray that the bitterness and division and hatred that seems to just emanate through American society, when that begins to subside and we're praying it subsides, What's it going to look like for the Church of Jesus Christ in America? And I get there's a lot of people in that group that are a lot smarter than I am. I want to say that right off. I, I've never been the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'll put my hand up and confess that. There are some people there that um, really know their stuff. We keep coming back to an issue, though. It's deep. It's real. It's true. No matter how much we think and strategize, the future of the Church of Jesus Christ is really about how open we are to the work of the Holy Spirit to convict us, to reform us, to fill us, to change us, and lead us into the future to serve Jesus Christ. God's Spirit has never been taken from us. God has never forgotten us. And we will continue to search and beg and pray out of the depths of our hearts for the Holy Spirit to fill and mold and form Christ Church as we go into the future. I mean, I believe that the future is found in a deeper discipleship than what we practice now. God has blessed me in my lifetime to sit with Christians from all over the world. At the height of COVID, when we were talking about hand washing, one of the pastors I work with from Ghana in West Africa said to me, you know back home our people don't have enough water to wash their hands. Water is a commodity. I remember when I was still doing campus ministry at Dartmouth of the young woman before the big civil war in Syria said to me, oh, by the way, I'm not going home, Pastor, for Christmas break. I'm going to Syria and do street evangelism. I got some tracts in Arabic, and I'm going to hang around Damascus. And I said to her, Anna, her name was Anna Kim. I said, Anna, aren't your parents worried? And Anna said, no, Pastor. My parents would feel blessed if they had a child martyred for the kingdom of God. Wow. Could my parental heart ever be in that place before God? I remember my own daughter returning from Swaziland after a summer mission trip. And her suitcase was empty because she left all her clothes and toiletries and everything behind at the hospice that she had worked in for children dying of AIDS and tuberculosis. We're not going to find our way into the future without a deep submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We're not going to find our way into the future unless our hearts and our collective hearts are open to the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. 
But I believe God is remembering us because he's never forgotten us. And the journey into the future as the body of Christ is about a deeper discipleship and a deeper surrender. As God settles us once again after the previous storm and the wind of the Spirit blows over us fresh. I want to close with a story this morning. It's, it's kind of a vetri uh, Memorial Day story. I was born when my father was 40 years old. He didn't get around to getting married till he was 36. I thought I was going to emulate that until I met Laurie and then I got married at 25, huh? <laughs> my father got married at 36. And I, I was one of the people of my generation whose father was a World War II veteran. I have the Gideon Bible my father carried through World War II. Matter of fact, as any good rural Yankee as I have it in the gun cabinet. <laughs> With all the family guns. How's that? You know, that, that, I'm a small town New Hampshire, right? I got a gun cabinet and it's... I, Keep my father's Bible there. My father was working on the farm when he was drafted, and for a young man who had never been out of New Hampshire and off the farm, somehow he went across the beaches at Normandy and then up through Belgium and went through Bastogne and liberated it, and then crossed the Rhine into Germany. My father told the story frequently that in 1946 he was coming home. He was coming home. He said, and they shipped us down to the south of France where we would get on the ship, and I think it was Mar Marseille, and it was Thanksgiving Day. But the army had missed not planned well, and all we had for Thanksgiving dinner was turkey gravy on a couple of slices of bread and a little dollop of cranberry sauce. He said that was Thanksgiving dinner before we were going to get on the ship and come home. But I have to tell you something. It was the best Thanksgiving dinner I ever ate. Because we knew where we had been. And we knew where we were going. We were going home. And I've often thought of my father's story that describes the Christian journey. We know where we have been. We know where our souls have been when they didn't know Christ. We know what kind of lives we can live when we're not in tune with the Holy Spirit's work. We know what we can become in our best moments and our lowest moments. And we know what we go through in this world where God has not forgotten us. But we know that we are always remembered by the God of the universe. And no matter where we've been, and no matter where we are now, we're on our way home. It was the best Thanksgiving meal we ever ate. Because we know where we have been. And we know where we are going. Isn't this the best moment we have right now before God and Jesus Christ? Because we truly know where we have been 
and where we are going. In that place where death itself is dead in Christ. And the God of the universe will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And there will be no more crying or weeping or pain. Because as God remembered Mo Noah when the ark came to rest after the storm. After the storms and turmoils and challenges of this life. And in this moment, our God knows and remembers us. And God remembered Noah. Thank you for the invitation this morning. And God bless. The final hymn this morning on this Memorial Day weekend is 548, Charlie? 
His grace on thee. Amen. The Lord bless thee and the Lord keep thee. The Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace now and forevermore. Amen. And thank you.